<laughs> you fucking suck at PowerPoint, Tybeard. Yeah, well, you can do it next time. It's not like I enjoy doing this. Yeah, you do. It's amazing the incredible amount of time you put into this presentation and how incredibly shitty it still is. Okay, Peacemaker, <laughs> shut up. Dude, I didn't mean to put your father in prison. Then why'd you put him there, you fat fuck? Because I couldn't think of anybody else. What about Ariana Grande or Drake? What? Brad Pitt or Payne Stewart or Doug the Pug? Khloe Kardashian, the Red Tiger from Voltron, Fran Tarkenton, Joe Montana, Joe Montana, Eddie fuck? Murphy, Michael Jordan, Michael B. Jordan, BTS, Eugene Levy, fuck dude, John hell? Lovitz, shut the fuck up and listen, man, I'm giving you a list of people you could have done, Danny DeVito, Will Ferrell, Howard Stern, Baba Booey, Robin Ophelia, Quivers, Alice Cooper, Ozzy Osbourne, Sharon Osbourne, Bill Cosby, he just got out, he's got time on his hands, Amy Winehouse. Dude, Amy Winehouse is fucking dead. Optimus Prime, Shipwreck, Cobra Commander, the fucking cunts from Riverdale. All right, next time I fucking have to frame somebody, it'll be one of all those fucking thousands of people you just mentioned. Yeah, tell that to my dad. Peacemaker, shut the fuck up. Hey panelists, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And do you really, really want to taste it? <laughs> and I'm Steve. Steve's back. <laughs> Steve, you're back. And I am Rob. I'm back to I'm back too. Yes. Thank you so much. Rob's back too. So but Steve's been the longest gone, so this is so cool. Uh all right, we have a triumphant. We have the three of us, which is pretty cool. Uh Rob's been filling in while Steve's been gone. Steve's finally back. Uh, we're so grateful for him to be back. And this episode, we're going to be covering Peacemaker Season 1. We've already teased it on our Facebook page. Uh, I told you guys, hey, this is coming. Well, it's here now. Uh, for those of you who do not know what Peacemaker is, have not watched The Suicide Squad, have not watched the Peacemaker TV series, stop now. If you are very much susceptible to hating anything that would upset you within society. Do not watch the show because honestly, they tap on everything that is bad. And unless you have a really weird which sense we of do. humor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Which we all do. And you could take that with a grain of salt. That is the whole point behind Peacemaker, I think, because a lot of people are either A, upset, or love the show because it poked fun out of a lot of things that a lot of people are either A, disturbed of, or just know that it, it's done in that light heart. Uh, a lot of people got upset about the show, and I, I, I looked into it. It's so sad because people are like bashing it. And but there are people praising it. You can see a lot of YouTubers that are known that review these kind of things and just love it for the pure fact that they know it is humorous. It's poking humor into the world that is out there. And uh, like I said, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, it, it, it's fun to watch. Uh, we love the character. And obviously the character came and just to give you a bit of history. It came from the Suicide Squad, the movie The Suicide Squad that came out what about, two or three years ago? Three yeah. years ago? Yeah, I'd say two years yeah. ago. So uh, I had Idris Elba, I had John Cena, uh, a whole slew of people. They killed off the original Suicide Squad movie characters, except for Harley Quinn. Ho and uh, death, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Weasel still but lived. the weasel yep. still lived. <laughs> but uh, painted Peacemaker as a horrible person. But within this show itself, they actually, we get to know who that character is and grow to love the character himself. Yeah. As stupid as he is. Because honestly, <laughs> come on, guys. We all know that he's stupid. So, like we're saying, we're, we're talking about the show Peacemaker that was on HBO or HBO Max, if you have it. Uh, those that you loved it, great. Thank you for staying, because pretty sure everybody's being like, wait a minute. <laughs> they were racial on this? They were, they were everything. Well, really, mainly Robert They're... Patrick. But, you know, I mean, he's mainly the one who... who... Well, 
Oh, yeah. You know, Peacemaker had a little bit of, of some stuff, but mostly it was Robert Patrick, and he's gone now. So, yeah. well, I guess except for his visions, the ghost. Yeah. <laughs> well, spoilers for that, but yeah, he's gone. <laughs> yeah, they touch upon the they red pretty devil, much touch upon it, uh, as it were. P- touch upon everything. I mean, there there's no holds barred. Yeah, it's just I'm, I'm, yeah, it's not everything. Asian yeah. hatred and like oh, it just the like, white dragon, the uh, white dragon. But yeah, yeah. The white dragon. I said red dragon. Yeah. But he had red on him, so he had a little bit of red. Got red on you. (laughs) But uh, let's talk about the characters within the actual show. So we got John Cena, who is Peacemaker. We've seen him in movies like Blockers, Bumblebee, Fast and the Furious 9, The Suicide Squad, as well as John Cena, the wrestler for WWE. Unknown rapper as well. Correct. I was surprised at that one. (laughs) <laughs> when I uh, looked at uh, when I looked him up, I was like, "Oh, formal rapper." Hmm. You 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 didn't buy that CD when it came out? Uh, no, I don't <laughs> think I did. I did. I have it. I still have the uncensored version. Do you really? <laughs> yes, yes. It's still cool to listen to. Um, all right. So uh, next up, we have who else? Danielle Brooks played Leota. Uh, she was also on uh, Orange Is the New Black as Big Tasty. Yep. A uh, character that I did love in Orange is the New Black. And this way, uh, in this particular show, she did a lot that uh, made me like her more and more as an actress. Because it showed a different side of her. Because in Orange is the New Black, we only saw one side of these characters. But, you know, with this, we, we see a new thing of Danielle. And I really do appreciate it. I never got to see all of, uh, Orange, of uh, Orange is the New Black. Uh, just so I think like maybe the first two or three episodes, and then after that I just kind of drop you know dropped it. But oh okay, I've heard good things about it. I should probably you know go back and see it. Uh, next up, Rob. Next one is uh Freddie Stroma who plays Vigilante. Uh, you guys have probably seen him in the Harry Potter movie. So he was in uh, Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince, and he was also in the last two episodes or last two movies, uh, Harry Potter and the Deadly Hollows one and two. He was also hmm. in Game of Thrones, which I will have to go back and see which uh, who he was. You know, so, oh, awesome! Yeah, what is he of English descent? Do we know? Um, you know, when I was looking at some of the behind the scenes stuff, I did not, I did not notice an accent. Sometimes you all, all of a sudden you get an accent from you know these actors that you're like, oh wait yeah. a minute, <laughs> they're from uh, they're from a different place. But no, uh. He was uh, talking English, just normal English, so I have to assume he's from here. All right, cool. Uh, Next up would be uh, Chuck Woody Ouija, who played Judo Master, the little guy who we don't recognize from anything, but apparently was in John Wick Chapter 2, which I had covered on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast with Cat Craft, and why I didn't know that, I don't know. But uh, the little guy was there. And uh, he was also in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. No, he's coming out in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Oh, yeah. oh he's coming out as Guardians of the Galaxy 3 as right. the High Evolutionary. Wow. Yeah. That is awesome. So he went from DC to Marvel now. Right. Well, I don't think, he, I mean, I think it's called Ga- Guardians of the Galaxy 3 High Evolutionary. I don't think he is the High Evolutionary, but I don't hmm. know. Things will oh. change. <laughs> we, we, we'll know. If you do see him, you'll know him. <laughs> yeah. He's a short guy. <laughs> he's that short guy or the big head <laughs> exactly <laughs> and then we also had jennifer holland she played harcourt and she was in the movie brightburn and then she was also in black adam and the suicide squad playing the same character agent harcourt yeah yep and she's also uh james gunn's wife now mm. yes so that means so... that she's gonna get all the parts <laughs> <laughs> And nepotism runs greatly in the gun family. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sean is always there, too. So he's got to put his brother in everything as well. I think he played the weasel. <laughs> did he really? I, th- I, I think he did do the. Yeah, I think he was the. I think he did something with the motion capture for the weasel, I think. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, it's like Ron Howard putting uh, his brother in. His on, brother in, in. Yeah, in everything. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have Steve Agee, who plays Economist, and he plays a part in Guardians of the Galaxy 3, who is also in Brightburn. And just to mention to you listeners, too, you panelers, 
We did cover Brightburn when it came out in theaters, Steve and I, a long, long wow. time ago. How long ago was that? That was when it came out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm the bad guy. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, it was another uh, James Gunn movie, too, by the yeah. way. So uh, it was kind of what I like to say, the evil version of Superman <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> as a young kid. Yeah. What would happen if Superman was just a snot-nosed little shit? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And got his way. Uh, Mm -hmm. Next up, Rob. Next up is Robert Patrick. We all know him. You know, he played the White Dragon, August Smith, you know, um, Peacemaker's father. But Robert (laughs) Patrick is very well known as, of course, the T-1000 in Terminator 2. So, but his list of accomplishments and filmography is just so long. Oh, yeah. It's insane. Yeah, uh, it, it to me, it's so funny. He's the brother of a singer of a band, and it's in my head. Uh, do you trip like I do is the name of the song. Um, it's not... Wait, uh, I, know, I know the song I think you're talking about. There you go. So, let, let's do some little research here. Is it from Crystal <laughs> Method? Nope, it's not the Crystal Method. No? Okay. Uh, I'm going to say Robert Crystal Patrick's Skull? brother <laughs> is, and the band that he was in, uh, Richard Patrick, and he is the front man. Well, apparently, wait, he was in... No, not nine, nine inch nails. Oh my goodness! <laughs> uh, do you remember the movie, uh, the song "Picture"? Filter, the band Filter. His oh. brother is the lead singer of Filter. Sorry, it is on the tip of my brain. <laughs> so if you trip like I do, I forgot <laughs> and I tripped <laughs> over it. Uh, he was uh, uh, Robert was also in. Um, uh, he was also in. Uh, I'm gonna say Scorpion. The TV yeah, show he was Scorpion. In, yep. He did a couple seasons of the X Files back in yeah. the nineties. Yeah. The yeah. last the last two seasons when uh the last two seasons um, with Annabeth Gish. Yeah, when uh the uh, Coffney uh, decided to uh, not come back. But um the Coffney, yep, yep. And uh somebody else uh there was other actors within the X Files too. Right. Uh which blow my mind that uh you know, if if you look um he was in the movie where the guy got abducted by the aliens that was based off a true story. Yes, Fire in the Sky. I mean, just to kind of give you a, a lowdown, Die Hard 2, Wayne's World, mm-hmm. Broken, Fire in the Sky, The Last Action Hero, Double Dragon. Um, Crazy stuff. I mean, like, you look at his stuff and it's just movie after movie. He was from... Movie Dust- after movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. from Dust Till Dawn 2, The Faculty... Uh, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah just he's, to give an idea. Robert Patrick's been around for a long, long time. Long, but time. we most notably know him like what you know. Rob was saying, Terminator Two. Terminator Two is his, uh, I think, his uh, magnus opus. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Everybody yeah. remembers him, but now we know him as the, um, yeah, racist uh, <laughs> father of Peacemaker, Chris, <laughs> Chris Smith. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> Finally, the the last last one that we have on our list here of notables is Elizabeth Bates Ludlow. She played Leota's wife. I don't know if we ever get her name uh, in the show. I don't remember, but uh, she uh, I was a rat. Her name as well. uh, she was a rat on The Walking Dead for a couple of seasons. Uh, she was in Netflix's Another Life, and she also was in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. Yep, uh, people that faces we may know. Something that we got out of uh, Adrenaline Cinema podcast that I do for my other podcasts. I just throw those in for the fact that it just equates to where we've seen them before. And that way, if you haven't seen them before, you make makes you want to go see them in those shows or movies. Because sometimes you just got to see those for the fun of it, you know? By the way, Elizabeth uh, Elizabeth's uh, character's name is Kia Adebayo, something like that, in, okay. the, in the, uh, show. Oh. the show. Okay, okay so. Kia. Okay. Kia. Okay, cool. Good to know. <laughs> um, but as we stated in the very beginning, this is going to be a season one overall review. Uh, us talking about the show, what we loved about the show, quotes, uh, scenes that we liked, 
the characters, what we like about the characters, and where we see Season 2 possibly going, and what we're going to get out of it, plus the news of the DCU, which might affect how Peacemaker Season 2 comes, because James Gunn is now head of DC, just, he's the Kevin Feige of DCU, right. so how how could this change the uh the whole environment of the dc cinematic universe uh with uh, james gunn in charge but uh, i have a few ideas and thoughts based upon that and we'll get into that at the very end so sorry spoilers end of conversation of the show so if you're waiting for that you could just shoot ahead if you want <laughs> but uh in this case we're going to move right along and go into our general thoughts of the season, overall thoughts. Uh, Steve, we'll start with you since you're back. You're finally back. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, when I Originally, when we started planning on this, I watched the Suicide Squad movie and then I binged through the first season in like a couple of days just a few weeks ago. And I had – I don't know how I had totally forgot the major plot lines and how good this movie was uh, – this movie – this show uh, really was. But I think – what impressed me the most is just John Cena is how he has grown as an actor. And I mean, we know from the professional wrestling days, obviously there's acting involved in that there's, but he's also done so many things And this, this show really gave him a chance to uh, spread his wings, you know, so to speak, we, we saw him have this anxiety breakdown uh, that was just, amazing to watch the, the the pain and anguish on his on his face and the anxiety but also just to see when we see him in that second episode when he realizes that he's pushed away everybody who's around him you know I, i'm getting more into uh, general thoughts but general thoughts is uh yeah there was so many things i had forgotten about from the first viewing to the second viewing was what amazed me the most was the the little things i picked up on and and that i really enjoyed the show uh, quite a bit Cool. And Rob? Yeah, my my uh, my initial thought on this. So I saw this uh, when it first came out and then just kind of reviewing it again for this, uh, you know, for this episode. I was amazed on how good this this is. Um, James Gunn does a phenomenal job with the fact that he could take the most uh, obscure characters and, you know, just characters that really are not in the forefront of, you know, like what we have grown up with and just make them very memorable. And I like, and I really like the fact that he doesn't hold back when it comes to being very risky at the stuff that he covers. So, I mean, like the, the character of peacemaker is just a deplorable human being, but at the same time, he gives him a lot of heart. He gives the character a lot of heart. And you can see that this is a character that is, you know, you could see where he comes from too, you know, what, how he became who he is. And at some point, even though there are times that you kind of say to yourself, Jesus Christ, this guy's such an asshole. Mm. But then you still feel sorry for him. And you kind of, you know, and your heart breaks for him sometimes because you're like, well, mm. you know, I could see why he is who he is. Um, and all the other characters within the show are great compliments, to, you know, to, to him. So I thought it was very well done. Extremely funny. There was just not one episode that you could say that, you know, you got bored with or it was a filler episode. Nothing like that. Went straight to the point. The jokes were just insane. Some of them you just kind of stood there with your mouth open <laughs> going, oh, my God, I can't believe they just said that. But it's a show where you could tell that these actors probably had the time of their lives doing this show, which was great. So, yeah, great show. I loved it, and I can't wait to see what you know they come up with uh, for season two. Yeah, my my overall thoughts. I have to agree with you a lot of it, and honestly, to top on that for the fact that both Rob and I work together, so this was water cooler talk literally for <laughs> yeah. Rob and I in the very beginning as he started Fantasy Picks Movie Edition, and I said to him blatantly. We should have been covering this for Panels to Pixels podcast in the very beginning. Yes. And Steve and I didn't because we already had, what, three shows we were covering, I think, at the time when this came uh, out. I think at, at the time, I think there was like two or three shows we were doing all at the and, same time. And, and it would have been like... so much. So we figured, you know what? It's going to get a season two. It's already greenlit for it. So the idea was like, 
my overall idea is like, you know what? We'll just do it as a season and mm-hmm. then do it as a whole. We're not going to do it episodically. Now, mind you, there are only eight episodes. There are maybe about 40 minutes piece each yeah. episode. But if you really want to go uh, have us go through every episode independently, you vote on that. and You let us know. And that happens in feedback, everybody. Keep that in mind. I would happily do that because every show, <laughs> honestly, every show is a work of art. And the amount yeah. of quotes, uh, it's funny because in this show, we we always do favorite quotes from a movie or something like that or from an episode. There's yeah. at least seven or eight quotes per episode that are just <laughs> memorable and to die for. It's just the yes. amount of stuff they cram so much in there. And you're mm-hmm. just, you know, it's, you don't get bored. You definitely don't get bored from this. Yeah. And to add to my overall thoughts, just to top on what you both had said, uh, I love that we got, uh, a, to me, honestly, this was a growing of a family coming together. Even they were forced together very much like any superhero group. But in this case, it was a group that was all messed up in the very beginning and they found each other in a certain way. Chris not only just had his best friend in Eglia, but at the very end, he had Leota. That's his second best friend. Right. So uh, uh, aside from Vigilante, who thinks he was always his best friend, but, you know, they did <laughs> love blowing things up. But the fact is, is that we saw a lot of character growth and we saw a character history and we got to see who Chris was and how messed up his past was and where he came from and how he had to be and why he killed flag. And then we see something different about Chris at the very end towards the end of the episode, because he states that he could kill children in the suicide squad and he just couldn't do it. And we get that one, you know, I'm going to throw this out. That's a little bit of a nugget in the, of one of my favorite scenes is yeah. that he couldn't do it. He couldn't kill a kid. And of course, Vigilante just comes over and <laughs> and does it. But well, in the beginning, I feel like he couldn't kill the kid because he didn't know what was going on. They didn't they didn't tell him yeah. what's going on. So it was just like, hey, kill the whole family. He's like, uh, you know, why would I do that? Uh, right. I think once he, he needed a reason, right? A specific. And they yeah. didn't realize, you know, he didn't realize the, the whole butterfly thing and things like that. So I think that's what really. I, I think later on he says he just doesn't want to kill anymore, which I thought that was actually very interesting. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if that part was because of that or if it was because he was just mad that they did not tell him, hey, this is what's going – this is what's really going on. He just ha- – he had to have just cause because right. it seems like if you point Chris in a direction – and this is my first of my favorite scenes. Uh, he had to have just cause for that particular killing. And then Vigilante, as we know, <laughs> that particular character, oh my god, he just doesn't care. But, like, but he does care for his toe yeah, getting cut that, off. That or character partially is cut so off. funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, what's a scene that you guys like, Over, like uh, a scene that you like? It could be sporadic within the actual show itself or season. One for me was today, like I said earlier before we started recording, I rewatched the first two episodes and the last two episodes just today, just before we started recording. Yeah. In the first episode, the scene that had me just rolling is when he's in the hallway talking to the janitor and he's like, can I trust you? And the guy's like, no. And he's like, but no, really, can I trust you? No, you can't trust me. I'm not trust. Like, like <laughs> that whole scene is just of them. He's like, well, if I tell you something, will you keep it in confidence? Of course I can keep a secret. That's the exact opposite of everything you've just been telling me, you know, <laughs> and just that whole idea. And the guy goes like, like I went to MIT and he's like, you went to MIT? He's like. Yeah, and I'm doing this, so obviously I'm not trustworthy, you know. <laughs> so that yeah. that was the very first scene that I had totally forgotten about, and it's just this character that I don't think we ever see him again. Oh, we do. Oh, you're right. There is there's a later episode that he's he in. He shows right. up at his son's like bring. Uh, yeah, the uh, the, the classroom. He brings him to the to school to, to, <laughs> Correct. to school. That's, his, right. Uh, That's right. It okay. was uh, supposed to be uh, that he was making believe he was a son. Uh, uncle or something like that yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah something like that you're right you're right he does, he does come back later in the and in then the, he starts making season, fun but... of the kids too John, <laughs> yeah <laughs> chris yeah and they asked him about flash he goes yeah he's kind of a dick <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, that for me, that was that was one of the standout scenes of the of the the series was just that that interaction right there in the hall. We smoked weed together, you know. It's, <laughs> That was a one-time thing, man. You know, <laughs> the best Just, part of that intro though was the fact that they started talking about Aquaman and how you know he he has like sex with uh with fishes, fish. and yeah. it's funny because that comes back in the end, which I thought it was actually very funny too. Um, so they did that with a lot of uh, a lot of other superheroes regarding the DC universe, mm-hmm. right? Uh, especially during that classroom scene. When he goes, uh, the kid goes, have you ever met Wonder Woman? Oh, you didn't answer. You didn't raise your hand. Well, it's like, have you ever met Wonder Woman? He goes, oh, yeah, she IF'd me from across the room. He goes, and then the, the, the kid's father was like, who brought him there was like, hey, dude. He goes, I said IFing. I didn't use the F word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the fact that they do mention, you know, the Flash, Wonder Woman, Superman. Right. Aquaman all these people and how you know they are related to some degree within this and the fact is it's like james gunn poking fun at the dcu at that time oh, of course and, and then we get that that spoilery thing at the very end where you we do see two of the justice league there that were in snyder's cut or right Whoever else has cut that you want to talk about because there's so many cuts. But honestly, there there's only one cut that I would like. And I did enjoy the Snyder cut a little bit more than I got with, who was it? Joss Whedon. Oh, no. You know, Josh, I, Josh Whedon was just, that's a, that was an atrocious movie. So, <laughs> But both are atrocious in my opinion overall. It could have been done a far a lot better. Uh, the only thing cool about it was Batfleck. But, uh, and we you know, Cavill trying to work it out. And, you know, I, I got to give credit where credit's due. I always say this, and I, and it's how I feel about Fear of the Walking Dead. It's like, there are great actors. They're just trying to do their best at acting in it from what they're given. Right. And if they're given crap, they're doing their best to give out that crap. <laughs> you got to give them that credit. Exactly. Uh, if they were given better, it would have been amazing. Uh, I think... Uh, you know, honestly, I, I would love to have Ben back as Batfleck, ho- hoping that we get this little snippet in the Flash movie at least. Uh, I know we're getting Keaton to some degree too, but they right. better not edit out. But we digress. Let's go back into Peacemaker. <laughs> and I'm not talking into Peacemaker himself because <laughs> I don't want to see John Cena that way. Uh, he, he's a nice guy. He's handsome, but I, I don't want to see him that way. Um <laughs> But you really uh, put a lot of thought into this, haven't you? <laughs> no, not really. No, sorry. We, we we tend to have like a little weird humor here. Everybody, you guys know this, but uh, we'll we'll move on. Um, another favorite scene. Let's go. Who's got one? Uh, Rob, you you yeah, go. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I like I like the the fart sound scene where. Um, Leota's trying to apologize for what she did to Peacemaker. So uh, on the show, you know, uh, it, you know, what I'm sure you said spoilers ahead for everything that's, you know, happened. Oh, a so, ton. <laughs> yeah. So Leota's actually uh, Waller's uh, daughter. Yes. And so Waller's trying to frame Peacemaker by putting, you know, this diary that has all these things, you know, that's making him look like a uh, like a psychopath. And so she does, you know, frame him. And later, you know, uh, Peacemaker finds out about it. And she's trying to apologize because she did she did feel bad. She didn't want to do something like that to, you know, because she's getting to know Peacemaker. And every time she tries to apologize, he's like, and yeah. and then all of a sudden Vigilante joins in. And it was just it's fart fest <laughs> of them doing these raspberries back and forth. And they just wouldn't let her talk. And I was just thought it was the funniest thing because it's like they're just being such dicks. Yeah. So, yeah, I thought it was actually a pretty cool scene. I really did enjoy when they were in the van all together after the last mission and they were singing together with a glam rock yes. music. Now, mind you, of all things, John Cena, a person who did a rap CD and grew up on hip hop, had to do a rap CD while he was a WWE wrestler, is into glam metal. 
And I'm like, you knew he had to love <laughs> these bands. But the fact is that we get certain instances. He, he's talking to, all right, uh, the butterfly chick that he rails in the bar <laughs> at the very end. And he's screaming out, America! As he's behind <laughs> her. And then he takes her to her apartment. And he's still doing her, but right. falls in love while he's half naked looking at her record collection going, oh my God, you got this. You got Cinderella. Oh my God. And at the very end, of course, he winds up killing her. But taking her record collection in the end, but continuing on with that theme that James Gunn does because it's music. Right. And we get the glam metal feel, not just from the intro of the show itself. Not I'm saying movie, but show when they do the little dance, which is the best part of the show. And I don't skip it one bit. Anytime I watch this show. I have to sit there and watch them do their little weird dance, especially when Robert Patrick does his little scuttle and (laughs) jolt. (laughs) And, you know, you you got, you know, the the little guy jumping on, Judo Master jumping on John Cena's shoulder and then eagerly coming out. Right. How ridiculous is it? But the fact that it is glam metal. And I was... Honestly, listeners, you guys know me. I grew up in music. I've been playing bass guitar since I was 16. I played in a lot of metal bands. I was more of the other metal bands like Iron Maiden, Metallica, Pantera, all that good stuff. All the heavier stuff. We hated glam back in the 80s. As I've gotten older, I've learn to appreciate and understand and like it as well. So I do like that stuff. I always loved Guns N' Roses because, it, honestly, it was to me, it was regular rock and roll. But the fact that John Cena, of all things, a guy who I thought, first off, of all things, was a rapper because he put out a rap CD in WWE. And then James Gunn and his love of music in general and putting that into his movies, shows, and everything else, and picking out key songs. He had Motley Crue songs in there, Cinderella songs in there. The soundtrack in itself, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a Spotify playlist for Peacemaker. Oh, there is already. Yeah, it. there is already, and as a matter of fact, yeah. there are albums out there. <laughs> Let me tell you, the, the the I would have to say the the soundtrack budget for this was insane. Yeah, like I the do. amount of money they gave to like because you know um, paying for the rights, you know, to play these things, you know, costs a lot of money. House of Pain, everybody. I mean, it uh, was, was insane. House of Pain was a song, not. The- so, yeah, yeah, no, but, yeah. It, it was pretty cool. I mean, yeah, no, he uh, he did a good job with that. Uh, I like the like you said, the intro, believe it or not, that intro. And here's a funny tidbit on that. Okay, the person, first of all, that intro was recorded, it was done in one day, and okay. they did rehearse it in a school uh, cafeteria, <laughs> and I think that's where they also filmed it, but. The person who I think the choreographer was, believe it or not, Al- Alan Tudyk's wife. Oh, so huh. yeah. So uh, for for you guys who don't know who I, he's, the guy who played um, Wash on Firefly. And- yes. So the, his wife is the one that actually, you know, and he did. He actually had uh, Alan Tudyk actually did stand-ins for John Cena when John Cena couldn't be there for uh, rehearsal. So oh, wow. it was very interesting, yeah. But it was just something that you know, James Gunn decided. Hey, I want a, uh, I want a musical uh, number in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice, nice. Uh, Steve, do you have another uh, favorite scene? The, uh, the 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 shootout in in the warehouse, the one that actually gets him on the police's radar when he's got his X ray vision. Helmet, you know, he, he goes through, especially the way it starts was like they're going to go in quiet and try to be undercover. And like as soon as he sees the first butterfly, he just shoots. He just shoots and kills them. And Leo is like, what are you doing? He's like, butterfly. And like like every time he sees a butterfly, he just shoots it. And uh, that, that whole that whole fight scene through there. And then just the running gag of Leota not being able to do action. And then we in that last episode, we see her, hmm. you know. Do do these action moves and, and firing two guns and killing multiple people 
to go in there and save Harcourt was was just great. But I love that that running gag throughout the season of every time she tries to go into action, people stop her and they're like, no, no, don't. You know, and like one time Harcourt's like, ease up, Jason Bourne. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> like that to her. And, and but then that payoff in the last the last episode where she's like, I was born for this shit. You know, and she just takes the two guns and, and goes crazy. I thought it was great. Yeah. So, so that that running that it's not one scene in particular, but that running gag of her not her being so excited about being in the action and then not being allowed to be part of the action until she has to. So, yeah, it, it was a thing where she just like, you know, because, of course, she's not used to that. But at the same time, she was a little excited about it, but she did not want to do it. And the funny I thought the funny part was that every time John Cena, you know, kill somebody. Then she went ahead and shot the person. He he had to was like, listen, stop shooting them after I kill them. <laughs> you don't have to do that. So it was just one of that. It was like you said, that running gag of just her trying to come into herself. I think you know to try to be an act, you know like this action person. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one uh, scene that I did enjoy was. Uh, Remember the couple in the apartment that he had to hide out in and he took them hostage? Oh, and then later God. he winds up in bed with them to get them. No, it's it's him no. and Vigilante do yes. a three way do a three way with the wife. The husband's the wife? not involved. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Vigilante's oh. Vigilante's in bed, he still has his mask on because he does this is before his, his identity is revealed. He's still got his mask on and he's in bed with them and they're like smoking pot and he's like, you know, three years ago I would have to shoot and kill you guys for doing for smoking pot. That's right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I forgot. About and now this is legal, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I just love that Freddie Stroma. Uh, he actually, I did look it up. He is from the United Kingdom. Is he? So, okay. okay. Yes. So he is English. So he does cover up his accent very well and does it so well. The fact the way he plays vigilante himself. And even the way that, you know, if you think about Chris Peacemaker himself talks about Adrian, he says, it's like, oh, that was my friend's uh, stupid kid brother that was all into his, like, D&D and all that stuff. (laughs) Mind you, he's been following Chris all this time. Right. And being vigilante and blowing stuff up. And that's also a cool thing, too, that I like with the fact that they get together as vigilante and peacemaker. And they just love blowing crap up. Yeah. yeah. That's how they release tension. And the microwave, the the popcorn machine, everything out in the back. And they just have fun shooting at, you, at each other. Like the crossbow to the head. Everything. It was like those scenes were so hilarious just to watch. Just to see the humor in it and how dangerous it is. <laughs> it's well, yeah, yeah, it's to- just like, let's go ahead. No, I was going to say it's funny because when you first see the character, you say to yourself, okay, you know, he's he's kind of a dorky kind of character. And, and unstable. <laughs> right, and unstable, but you don't realize, okay, maybe, you know, he's just a wannabe, you know, vigilante or something like that. And then when he goes to jail and he confronts, you know, the uh, the group of... Uh, Augie. Yeah, Augie and his group. And all of a sudden, he just takes down the entire group in such yeah, an efficient way. Yeah, you see how capable, how capable he really is. Yes. Yeah, and you're like, oh, this guy's dangerous. This guy's not only crazy, <laughs> but this guy's completely dangerous. Well, that's another one of those running running things throughout the whole the whole season, right? Is that that the kind of the, the juxtaposition of Chris and Vigilante, the difference between the two of them is Chris is not a psychopath. You right. know, Chris, like we talked about earlier, he has to have a reason to kill someone. Vigilante, Correct. they make it's it's peppered through, and it's it's like little comments every once in a while from that other characters make. They go, "Yeah, that guy's a sociopath." Yeah, like we can tell that guy has no emotion. That guy yep. is definitely Correct. crazy. You know, and then like when they kidnap the the they the nurses at the uh, the animal shelter. <laughs> right and and after they leave, they're like, man, I, I really feel for those guys. Yeah, except for that one in blue, he's crazy. Yeah. You know, um, so they <laughs> that that's another one that was running that I, I look forward to that continuing in in the second season because uh, that's that's another one of those things. One of those moments I was going to talk about was the fact that uh, nobody like okay, yeah, there's a lot of people that died. Don't get me wrong, like the cops, but none of our <laughs> major characters except for Merle Mern. None of our major characters died. Like we have, Le- we know that Leota is still alive. We know that Harcourt is still alive, and she's having her physical therapy. You know, Chris is there. Vigilante is there. Mm-hmm. So, 
uh, Economist goes back to Bell Reeve. We see him go back to Bell Reeve and settle into some office and open his laptop and put the little picture of him and Vigilant. Them. Yeah, in the van, <laughs> right. you know, uh, on his on his desk. So we know we're going to have these characters come back in the second season. So I'm, I'm intrigued. We'll talk about that later about what we're looking forward to. But uh, yeah, that that whole running gag of Vigilante being crazy and a psychopath was was great. And that in Freddie Strom, he played it so well. Oh, yeah, that, absolutely. Just that straight face. You know, that, that whole conversation they have about sarcasm when he says, well, if you're going to use sarcasm, maybe you should warn people first, <laughs> you know, because he doesn't recognize sarcasm. And so, yeah, uh, it sounds like Drax and him would get along. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because yeah, in the after credits and they, uh, they I lo- you know what? what? The one thing I liked about the show was the after credits expand on certain scenes that, you could, you know, you could tell that James Gunn said, OK, I don't need to really run this gag too long. But he left it towards the end, and I thought that was funny because that part that you just said where, you know, about the uh, sarcasm, he really goes into it going, well, you know, like if you say, hey, I'm about to, you know, be sarcastic. <laughs> and then he just tells him, like, and they're looking at him like an idiot. Like, that's not <laughs> yeah. what, that's not how it works. So, but yeah, the, the after credits are, I think, one of my favorites, which caught me off guard because i didn't know there were after credits or they didn't warn anybody and then once you see it in the first episode you just look forward to it all the time yeah yeah and i think i stumbled upon it by accident in like the second or the third episode when i was originally watching this you know when it was week to week um i I just happened to leave the leave it running one day and i i was like like i said like the third or fourth episode uh in maybe third episode and i was like wait there's an after credit scene and then i had to go back to the first two episodes, right, and and watch them again to see is there is there after credit scenes on all of these? And I was like, sure enough, there is. There's the couple, you know, picking out the 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 person in the police lineup with all the pictures, and the wife saying, "Can I keep this one?" You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one person that we're leaving out a lot is Clemson. Yeah, oh, you said that we didn't lose anybody. I thought we saw Clemson get crushed. He did. Do we know that. Yeah, so he's gone. He's yeah, he, the only he's one. dead. Yeah, I mean, after they discuss, you know, after the uh, the butterfly, they took or I think escaped. Oh yeah, I mean yeah. the cops. Like I said, the cops all all the cops died. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the the, the detective, the captain, the yeah, the, Larry the, and the, Sophie the, are definitely the, dead. The, right, the chief of police, they all they all did. But like like I said, of our of our main characters, like characters, economists. Yeah. yeah, of our our protagonist. Let me go this way with our of our protagonists. Right, basically. <laughs> Um, we didn't really lose anybody except for Merle. That is true, right? And we knew we were, we, we should have known that we were going to lose Merle, especially once we discovered that he had a butterfly in it. So true, that is true. I was hoping that I was hoping that uh, you know he would probably be in the second season, but I mean the way they it's funny how they you know that when they she picked them up, you know who was it? Um, the detective, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, there was a. The, uh, uh, the Asian detective Annie uh, Chang, who plays Annie the Chang, right. song. yeah, yeah, but no, but hardcore. Uh, she picked him up, and it, he was just like dying in her hands, and it was just like you guys just made like you know some praying mantis, you know, <laughs> have a you know like this uh, little scene, you know, this. Uh, oh yes, Merle. Scene. I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah, right. Well, it was heartfelt too, the way he described how uh, because you get uh, you get Leota talking what she does because she gets peacemaker's uh, x-ray helmet right puts it on and sees him for the first time the next episode they have this conversation and now harcourt saying hey i realized who he was because he got blown up by a bomb and nothing really did that, anything right. and and she goes oh and waller doesn't know anything of it so we're keeping that from her and the fact is is that he describes how he took the most because Leota was like, you, you just took somebody's life. You took over their body. And he had to describe what it feels like waking up every day with the memories of this crazy person that killed people and how disgusting that they are and how he has to live that tragedy over and over again every day. Right. While he's living in that body with, as a butterfly and controlling that body. And if you think about it, ultimately they did what Merle wanted to do because Merle's whole thing was the reason he broke off from the other butterflies was he said, humanity needs to have, have, have its own um, opportunity to make its own mistakes. We can't, we can't rule over them 
and, yes. and just and just stop them from making their mistakes. And that's basically what Chris says at the end, or or what they they just when Chris decides to kill the cow uh, at the end is he's like, well, it's, maybe I did I just kill the world, you know? Mm-hmm. And Leo is like, maybe, but at least we don't have to live under our bug overlords, right. you know? So so ultimately, they did they accomplished Merle's mission, what the mission was that he wanted them to do. So correct. Mm. And again, like, that's why I always said, you know, it's amazing how this show, um, as funny as it is and as uh, risky as it is, every character had really good character development. Even the alien, you know, mm-hmm. you kind of, you know, felt for it at, you know, at the end when, you know, when he got crushed because you understood, you understood that, hey, you know, he's he's just going against his own kind because he just doesn't feel like this is right. You know, so. Again, well, and then you even get Goff on on one hand. You get Goff because she's like pleading with Chris to let us help you, right? You know, and then at the end, she ends up there on the porch with him, and he brings out some of the amber liquid. I don't know how much he's got left, how long he's going to keep be able to keep her alive, but eh, he probably took a few canisters. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else that you'd like to talk about, or? Should we move on to quotes? the two the two types of babies? There's babies <laughs> that come out of vaginas and ba- and then they're butt babies. Remember that one? <laughs> <laughs> this is why I wish I had, I had binged it more recently and missed some of those 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 precious moments. It's like there. my brother told me there are two types of babies: normal babies come out of vaginas, and then the crazy <laughs> ones come out of butt babies. And I I was just I was just dying when I heard that. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> Well, and like when his brother, when his brother and he are in the 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 room together, and they're listening to the rock and roll, and the brother shows him the devil, the devil sign, you right. know, and oh and yeah, Chris, young Chris is like, is that white power? And his brother's like, f white power, you know, because <laughs> right. yeah. he can see. So really, not buying into the dad's prejudices right. and, and racism, and we see that Chris didn't really, even though it, people say he was killing more. That he was a racist. I don't. I don't think him as a character. We didn't. We never saw that. Not in the Suicide Squad or in this. Right. We didn't see Chris as a character as a, as a racist. And so I, I wonder if all of that was just a reflection from his father that was reflected onto him oh, because of, of the things he was yeah, doing. Yeah. I mean, when you see so. the scene, I mean, it, and it's sad actually. And again, this is that development of that character. It's sad to know that his father, being who he was, not only was he a piece of shit. That's why, you know, when you when you look at his, you know, his father, who is actually, you know, not only a racist, hanging out with all these rednecks, but the fact that he's actually pitting the two brothers against each other so they could fight, and they're edging, you know, edging them on to, you know, hit each other and stuff like that. And when he finally hits his brother, and his brother dies because you could tell his brother didn't. I don't think died from the punch that he got hit yeah he, he was foaming at the mouth so foaming, i don't know right what i think he probably got some kind of seizure or something or something happened but his father blamed him and it's like are you crazy i mean you're the one that actually made them do this mm-hmm. you know so they're just and and when you see them in the room of course you know they're they're listening to music and stuff and that's what kids do you know they, they love that kind yeah. of stuff and mm-hmm. here it is you have a father that just decided that hey not only did he you know did the child die, but now he's going to blame everything on this poor kid from that point on. And that's why, you know, he is, you know, that's why Peacemaker is who he is Mm. when he grows up and he's just kind of like, I guess, divided in everything. You know, he wants to love his dad and get the approval of his dad, but he still recognizes his father is just a horrible human being, you know? And of course he even kills his own father. And it's funny because he killed him and then, didn't realize at that moment that he just killed his father until he pulled the trigger, you know, and that's, that was another part that, you know, when he was on the floor crying and stuff like that, it's like, you could tell that, you know, this is a person that's been hurting for years and I, and it was just such a great moment, you know, and as funny as, you know, as funny as the show was, but it really showed some heart, you know, when it came to that. It had time, some moments that really did tug at your heartstrings and it showed, who they were as stupid as they were like look at chris right and he had to grow as a character and you know between harcourt leota 
uh, even um, Mern himself and right. dyed hair dude. Kanto or what's his name? Economist didn't die. He just broke his leg. No, yeah. but I'm just oh. saying, but he had to grow. Economist oh, grew yeah. on him. Right. And they mm-hmm. kind of grew a rapport and feeling. So they kind of grew as a group together. And they grew on Chris, and Chris grew on them. Yes. Absolutely. And even well, Vigilante, of all things, too, grew on all of them, as well as Chris, because he realized, I need this. This is, like, my family at this point. Yes. And that was great. It's what, I- it's what you said earlier, what you talked about earlier, is James Gunn has this, from the Guardians of the Galaxy movies to the Suicide Squad to yeah. this TV series, he has a way of being able to blend – the comedy, the action, and even the drama, and get and get that out of his actors. Correct. Mm-hmm. You know, because he didn't direct every episode, but I'm sure he had a hand in just about every. I think every he aspect wrote. I think production. he wrote every episode, and he directed a few. But I, I forgot who the other person was. But yeah, no, that that's. I think that's one of the great things. I think that's one of the great things about him and his talent is how he brings that out. When you watch Guardians of the Galaxy, you know. How the hell do you make a raccoon and a tree become so iconic, you know, and but he did. And, you know, and it was just and like at the end of uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, I mean, you you felt for, you know, Groot, you know, dying. And then on the second Ga- Guardians, it was all about, you know, how Rocket, you know, was just alienating everybody because he was such a douchebag. But he just makes like these characters that are just offbeat characters that are just, you know, like the rejects and stuff like that. He just makes you feel for them. And I like that. I, I just thought that he did a great job on that. So he knows how to develop the characters. Yes. To make us love them. Yeah. Exactly. And I really do enjoy that too. Uh, like Ga- guardians of the galaxy came out of nowhere. Peacemaker came literally out of nowhere. Just the same. Cause who would have thought that they would create a character, a standalone show about this particular character who at the very end of the Suicide Squad, everybody hated. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because of him killing Flag, who was the last person that we had from the first, you know, Suicide Squad. Let me tell you, when I heard, when I saw, here's the, the other thing that was, that's great about, you know, James Gunn is, the first Suicide Squad movie was just atrocious. And, oh, yeah. and of course they had Will Smith on it and stuff like that, which you would think, oh, Will Smith being in it is going to, you know, Bring in a lot of money. This thing was just a horrible movie. And then comes James Gunn and he just kind of reboots that, you know, the whole uh, Suicide Squad and makes you love these characters all of a sudden. And while Peacemaker was that douchebag that, you know, everybody hated, when you hear about, oh, there's a show about Peacemaker, my first thought was, out of the dumbest character of them all, you're going to make a a freaking show? (laughs) And it just turned out to be a great show. And it's like, he just has the ability to just grab these characters that nobody likes and just say, I'm going to, not only am I going to make a great show, I'm going to make you fall in love with this damn character. And you're going to want to see more. And it's true. And it's been like that ever since. Any other quotes that we could talk about? Oh, in quotes. Oh my God. Like there are there so many. Uh, there, there's one that makes me laugh. That <laughs> it's I'm forgetting who said it, and I'm pretty sure it's Chris, as he usually is. And it's like, uh, if we have a kid, I'd like to name her Octopussy. And if That's it's Leota. a boy, that was Leota. <laughs> yeah, Sharknado. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I forgot where I got it from. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> No, that was actually great. <laughs> I like when he had the x-ray, you know, like, again, the x-ray uh, helmet. And he's like, can you maybe up the contrast on the x-ray a little? So my um, so my more... muscles look great. Yeah, so yeah. I have more definitions on my muscle or something like that. It's just like the kind of stuff that you hear and say, it's... like, you're such a dumbass. <laughs> yeah, and the doctor's like, this is not for your tender profile, Chris. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh, I like the one you've got here that when he's talking about Batman and he's like, he's a jackass who wrestles with murderers dressed like clowns and throws them in prison so they can break out of prison and then murder more people. I just – that was one of those – That was with awesome old... because it's true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when you think about it, that's exactly what Batman does. He just – you know, he never kills. He puts them in, in you know, in a Arkham Asylum or whatever it is, but they always break out. So – 
where he covered yeah. that, I was like, you know, you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just love what Economist says about goes. Oh, sweet! We have a piano that's useful for black ops. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to get in the office. <laughs> the one that actually made me laugh was Wookies have teeth in their assholes. That's ca- yep. That's canon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then like just because that theories. child is unattractive doesn't mean I want to kill it. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh, oh, yeah. oh, this goes into how racist that uh, the white dragon is, and how Robert Patrick is a ching chong chickity chong chong, and <laughs> she just responds back. It's like, yeah, you just said, uh, uh, I just you just shed on my head and blah blah blah. Right? No, she just <laughs> threw it right back at him. I, you know, that was another thing about that character. It was just as as much as uh, Robert Patrick's character was always throwing these racist things at her. She just <laughs> knew how to turn it around and just whip it right back. <laughs> you like the whole chopsticks thing, and then she's like fork. <laughs> and her partner's like, "Why not a spoon?" She's like, "Everybody uses a spoon." I like uh, when he was talking actually to uh, to uh, the janitor in the beginning. He's like, he bangs chicks, good for him. He fucks dudes, got no problems with that. He starts fucking fish. That's taking it a step too far. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then and then at the end when when Aquaman is standing there and he's like, I hate that rumor. And the Flash, like, it's not a rumor. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, fuck you, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That that was it is funny because that was such a great like little uh scene, which was shocking. When I first saw that, I was like, Oh, I can't believe they did that. And yeah. at first I thought, all right, they're just gonna do the whole, you know, they put them in the background and you don't see their faces, but then all of a sudden you see Jason Momoa and uh Ezra Miller. And I was hoping they did the you know, they bought the other two you know, the other two actors in, but they didn't. But no. It was actually a cool scene. And they they filmed it like apart big time in two different studios too they weren't even in the same room yeah oh, wow. i heard about that because uh, he was that fil- so he wild. was filming aquaman and ezra miller was filming the flash and they flash. actually <laughs> they actually recorded that one scene that they're together separately interesting uh i just love when vigilante screams out because i'm just looking from behind a trash can it's a normal thing to do <laughs> Because they all noticed that he was there. Yeah, we see yeah. you. You're in costume. <laughs> That's totally inappropriate. Her, what is it? Her tits are way too big to be sugar tits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm going to apologize to everybody who's hearing this. I mean, we're just throwing out quotes from the show. <laughs> it's just it, the absurdity of this whole thing. It's just that's what makes it funny. Yeah, just like if someone doesn't have a pinky toe, they'd fall over. <laughs> <laughs> Vigilante is so stupid. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it's all the little, let me tell you, again, it's like we were saying, Mark, it just, every episode, seven to ten to like, I don't know, 20 things that you could just say, all of them were just ridiculous, funny things. Um, great quotes. Yeah, it's the most know. important toe in the human body, though. Yeah, so... <laughs> So I think, yeah, I think your, I think your listeners, honestly, should vote to see if they really want you to uh, cover each episode. Because each episode, if we cover each episode, we could definitely go over all the stuff that they said, you know. And it's great. Oh, big time! Yeah, it would be, every it would be episode fun. will have at least a good five quotes. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. All right. Well, I, I think we're done with quotes because we're going to just <laughs> drive it into the dirt. <laughs> All right. Yeah, no, it's great. So where are we next? Well, let's talk about some news. So, Rob, you have some news based upon uh, James Gunn and his announcements for the DCU. So let, let's move right along into that. Yeah. So James Gunn actually just came out, you know, a few days ago with uh, news about because everybody's been waiting for, hey, what's going to happen with the DCU? This whole thing, you know, the way DC and Warner Brothers has been handling that property has been pretty shitty. I mean, Zack Snyder did his own version, but then, of course, Zack Snyder 
leaving Justice League because, of course, he had a tragedy with his uh, daughter and Josh Whedon coming in and just really messing it all up. It just seems like everybody that was doing a movie for DC, uh, for Warner Brothers, that had a DC character, they were kind of going off in their own direction. And there was yeah. really no... What, while they were trying to make it all within the same universe, there was really no way kind of like seemed to, you know, be cohesive or something like that. And in the end, it just came, you know, it got to the point where it's like, oh, okay, so that's, you know, what they call elsewhere, 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 where um, you had the Robert Pattinson Batman, which has nothing to do with the Zack Snyderverse. Then yep. you had, of course, uh, what was it, the uh, Joker. Joker. Which also, you know, two amazing movies, and that's what really gets me. Is that those two movies were just absolutely great compared yeah. to the Snyderverse, but there was just nothing there. So of course, Warner Brothers did exactly what you know want, want they wanted to do, which is have their own Kevin Feige, and so they mm -hmm. asked James Gunn to do this, and everybody's been waiting to see. And then James Gunn, of course, the biggest, I think, the biggest debacle was where The Rock, uh. Dwayne Johnson tried to <laughs> basically take over the uh, DCU by saying that, you know, he's going to, you know, they're going to restart the DCU and all these things. And, you know, the, the hierarchy of power is going to change in the, in the DC universe. Yeah. You try to bring in um, Henry Cavill at the end of, you know, and I think that really rubbed off, you know, the executives in, um, in Warner brothers, because one uh, black Adam didn't do very well at all. It's a horrible no. movie. But two is the fact that he was just very arrogant about the whole thing. And I think he only cared about his own brand. So they put James Gunn in there. And James Gunn basically gave the boot to everybody saying that he's restarting everything. Oh, rebooting wow. The whole DCU. Rebooting the whole DCU. And everybody was expecting, okay, so that means Henry Cavill is gone. That means Gal Gadot is gone. Everybody's gone. Um, Except for Shazam, because they're going to continue on because we got another Shazam coming out. Well, here's the whole thing: the, the Shazam, Aquaman, and you know, and the Flash. Those three movies are still going to be. Uh, they're still going to let those out as, hey, this is the end of the Snyderverse, and then uh, the Flash is supposed to kind of reboot the entire DC universe or something like that. Yes, and there, there's there's a theory I have regarding that because. The idea in theory is literally you got Flashpoint. And within the Flash movie, you're going to get Flashpoint, which changes everything. Changes, you're going to have multiversal people, Correct. just like in Marvel. So you can have different versions coming in. They could still retain Shazam because he's still a mystical character and he can't be change because it is a bit mystical right uh they could change what superman looks like because it could be from another infinite earth that's out there same thing with flash flash could die in this and another version of flash could pop up for all we know we could get uh the flash from the the tv show the cw yeah grant gustin and we could get that flash to replace ezra miller if they feel free that Hey, Ezra is not doing what he needs right. to. Let's get the person that's been leading the reins in the show and people love. Or we just recast that person completely. The problem is that so while they said, hey, we're going to recast, you know, and of course, the, I guess the biggest thing that people were upset about was the fact that Henry Cavill announced. Oh, they made Henry Cavill announce that he was going to come back. And so many people were so happy. That yeah. finally Henry Cavill is going to be Superman again, and that Man of Steel was going to come out, you know, uh, hopefully in you know in a year or two or something like that, and that, that we finally were going to have another Superman movie. And then James Gunn comes in and says, "Nope, we're not using Henry Cavill," which meant, hey, he's going to reboot everybody. But then, with his announcement, all of a sudden he's keeping some people, but he's not going to, you know, so he's keeping part of the Snyderverse. Which he said that was not going to be, you know, that that era was gone. But he's still keeping uh, Peacemaker. He's still keeping um, Suicide Squad. He Correct. might keep a few other things. And it's like, so he's picking and choosing. So just mm -hmm. to, to kind of give you a rundown. So here are like the projects that he actually announced. So he announced Creature Commandos, which Creature Commandos is, I guess, 
it's just a group of, you know, like Frankenstein, you know, um, vampire or whatever it is. I, I never read the actual comic book itself. It was more of a DC version of the monster, like Steve. Correct. Well, actually, Rob, you, you and I talked about this when we covered uh, uh, Werewolf, by Night. Werewolf by Night right? at that time. And they had that kind of monster squad thing where they had Correct. Man-Thing, Orbius, and Ghost Rider and all that. It's kind of DC's version of that. Right, exactly. So they're having that. They're having a TV spinoff of Waller. Of a, uh, you know, so she's going to get her own, uh, you know, her own show. TV, her own show. They're going to have a Superman Legacy. It's called Superman Legacy, which is going to be a younger Superman. Um, I've heard yes. from some people thinking that what they're going to do is not really have a younger Superman, but really introduce Jonathan Kent, who is Superman's son. So it's kind of like up in the air and it's kind of a rumor going out there. But, you know, they're going to yeah. have also the, uh, the Green Lantern TV show, which is going to have uh, Hal Jordan and, and, um, and Jon Stewart mostly be like detectives. With, you know, so they're yeah, detectives in space. No, detectives <laughs> on Earth. Yes, exactly. That look on your face was the same look uh, I had on my face. I have that questionable, like dumb look on my face. Yeah. But, okay. No, it's uh, it's one of those things that you know a lot of people are like, what? I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna show the Lantern Corps. You're not gonna show you know Sinestro. You're not gonna show any of that. So they're also gonna do uh, Paradise Lost. So Paradise Lost is basically a prequel to Wonder Woman. So yes. it's going to take place in, of course, you know, um, in Wonder Woman's uh, world. And it's going to be more like a Game of Thrones, from what I hear. I'm like... With Amazonians. Yeah, uh, but... Literally, I'm, it's probably the history of the Amazonians and how they came to be. Right. In this case, she actually is molded by clay from... Uh, who was it? Zeus? Something like that. I'm not sure what the, uh, what the, whole, uh, the whole thing is. But this is supposed to be... In her, you know, in Themyscira, uh, it's set to elaborate on the political, you know, drama like, you know, uh, Game of Thrones. It will also be between the, the two Wonder Woman films, which suggests Gal Gadot may not totally be out of the uh, DCU, which hmm. is crazy because it's like, all right, they stopped Patty Jenkins from doing her movie because they said, no, you can't do that. So... There's kind of a lot of like he picked and choose what he wants to do, but I again I keep saying and I would love to interview you know Henry Cavill. What did you do to, to piss people <laughs> off? To piss <laughs> Warner Brothers off? That I mean, no matter how many times they change that regime, they just won't let you do Superman. You know, I so- did The Witcher. <laughs> it's literally his his answer because literally he already had a contract signed. Uh, for The Witcher at the time, what was it on HBO, Steve? Right, The Witcher's Netflix. Oh no, Netflix on uh, Netflix. Yeah, right, uh, on he Netflix, was already yeah. signed. He was already signed to that contract with Netflix, but he canceled that contract, and that's why we got a different version of a Witcher coming out. And he devoted himself to DC right around that time when this changeover happened. And he lost out on his contract. So now, hey, Marvel's picking and choosing. We we could get Captain Britain for all we know. We could get somebody new. Right. I mean, well, Henry Cavill, I mean, the thing is that when he was in uh, The Witcher. So if nobody knows out there, Henry Cavill is basically what I would say one of the biggest nerds and and pop culture fan out there except, along with Fr- john maganella yeah but except he's extremely good looking and then of course he's you know <laughs> he's basically the best of both worlds like the dream that we all wish we could you know be but yeah his he's a big fan of the witcher and he knows the lore very well and the writers mm-hmm. on the show did not want to follow the lore from the books or the lore from the game itself they wanted yeah. to go in a different direction and Henry Cavill was really pissed off about that because he's like, that's not the character. So he was going to exactly. leave. So from what I hear, he was going to leave that show anyway because the, you know, the writers just did not have, you know, any kind of respect for the character itself. Mm-hmm. So when this whole thing got announced with Superman, he figured he was going to go there. But then, of course, James Gunn said no. But believe it or not, now he's going to be part of a, 
So Amazon is actually uh, just picked up the rights to Warhammer, and he's going to be yep. in this in that show, from what you know they say. But uh, to to move along, so the next one is uh, the Brave and the Bold. That's going to be with Batman, and for the first time, we're going to get actually uh, what's his name, um, Damian da- Wayne. Damian Wayne, which a lot uh, again, you have a lot of people saying there's a lot of history on how Damian Wayne was introduced to Batman. Correct. How are they going to do that here? So there's also Booster Gold, which I'm going to be very honest with you. I have never been a fan of that uh, character. Me neither. But there's a Booster Gold movie. Uh, and a lot of it's, you know, a lot of these things are going to be also on HBO Max, too, which is kind of weird, too. They're gonna Not do necessarily, because we got um, uh, Doomsday Squad that is still available. Right. No, but I'm saying, so look, Booster Gold is going to be on HBO Max. Uh, mm-hmm. Paradise Lost will be HBO Max. Um, mm-hmm. And so is, I believe, is... Um, lanterns which is the green lantern and i can understand right that. Okay. and waller and then the creature commando is going to be an animated series which uh, is very good because dc puts out decent yeah you know and then there's yeah, going to be a supergirl movie. woman of tomorrow which is actually base is adapting tom king's uh recent miniseries that he just came out with and then mm-hmm. of course uh swamp thing so which is going to be a horror movie and then we're going to get blue beetle as well right so my thought on this is, and again, I'll see what James Gunn comes out with, but my thought is this. So when when the MCU actually did their stuff, mm-hmm. we as people that have been reading comic books for a long time and we grew up with them, we know, you know, the main characters out there from Marvel and DC. So, you know, Captain America, you know, Spider-Man, you know, the Hulk, Thor. You know, mm-hmm. you know all these characters, and these characters were characters that we have seen before, either on TV shows, on crappy, Cartoon. right, crappy movies, cartoons. So our thought was always, what if they ever put these great characters that have been around for fifty plus years in a movie yeah. and make them look great? And that's exactly what the MCU did. And then, of of course, then once they got people hooked, that's when they started doing the offshoot characters and stuff like that. In Correct. this case, I just feel like James Gunn said, well, you know, the Superman stuff is not, as a matter of fact, the Superman one, the Superman Legacy, is not even going to be the first movie coming out. That's coming out like in three years. He's putting yeah. other movies ahead of that. And I'm like, you know, your superstars are your, you know, your trinity, Superman, Batman, uh, Wonder Woman. Wonder if Woman. you are going to reboot this, then put, do it in sequence with the main characters. Yeah, put that those we characters out first, and, and then bring them together as a justice with League. other smaller ones where you start introducing things. But all of a sudden, you're introducing characters I never even heard of, or I could even care less for. But this is James Gunn again, and then James Gunn, you know, like I said, like we were just saying about you know Peacemaker, is that he knows how to take these characters that. Really, or unknown, unknown, and make them like Ex- Guardians of the Galaxy, exactly, and this the Suicide Squad that we got because we are going to see the Weasel again, exactly, so- and we're going to see possibly Harley Quinn. I wouldn't be surprised if he brings her back as that particular character. We might get a different Joker along we, the way, right? And we don't know what we don't know how. I mean, he, that from what they say is that so. Here's what they also said. They said, well, James Gunn is going to actually take anything that has to do with DC. So any any mm-hmm. animated show, any TV show, or any movie in the theaters all have to be within the same universe. But he still is going to have a Joker movie. He's still going to have Robert Pattinson and Batman, which has nothing to do with this universe. And he's also, I forgot what the other one, oh, um... The other Superman movie that's being written with Michael B. Jordan in it, that is still going. So it's like, so you want to bring all these universes together, but yet you're going to have all these different projects out there. All you're going to do is really confuse the audience. I think, you know, unlike, you know, where MCU, you know, has made sure that everything that comes out in movies actually does relate with each other. So I, I'm very curious on how he's going to do this. While a lot of people, other people are saying, oh, well, you know, it doesn't have to all be related to each other. And I was like, yeah, that you're right. But at this point, bring your Trinity first and then start. Because I guarantee you, Gar- Guardians of the Galaxy would not have been a big success if the MCU wasn't already established for several years. 
You know, maybe the people would have liked it and they say, oh, it's a great movie and it was funny and stuff like that. But the fact that it's part of the MCU just made people go, oh, I'll definitely want to see it because this has to do with the whole, you know, Infinity uh, Saga. So we'll see. But I was not very thrilled when I heard this. I was kind of like, you know, off put on this. There, uh, as a matter of fact, when this came out, um, Fire James Gunn was trending. <laughs> uh, hashtag uh, Fire James Gunn was trending <laughs> a lot. You know, so a lot of people are confused and a lot of people are just kind of like some people are excited. Some people are just kind of like, eh, at this point, I'm kind of the same way. I'm just like, well, I guess I'll wait to see what he does. But I have really no confidence on this whole. I'm not excited about it because there (laughs) if you think about it, the Flash, uh, Aquaman and what was the other one? Um, Those movies. If they're not going to be part of the, if the Zack Snyder verse is no longer going to be around, why do I care to even see those movies? Because they're not leading to it. I mean, I'm going to see them anyway, let's be honest. I'm going to see them anyway. The The Flash, I have more interest in based upon Flashpoint, uh, who we're supposed to see, which literally is Keaton right. and possibly Batfleck. And I need to see my Batman, my original <laughs> Batman from, you know, what was it, 89? Right, 89 Keaton. Batman. 89 Keaton Batman. I got to see that. I already saw 89 Keaton with Mr. Kevin Smith himself in a cinema that he owns. And I had a great time going back in time with uh, a bunch of Smog yeah. Castle fans for that. A lot but... of people are excited. Don't get me wrong. A lot of people are excited to see, yeah. uh, you know, Keaton go back as Batman and stuff. As a matter of fact, he was supposed to be in the Batgirl uh, movie, which movie, got scrapped. Which they can't. And they pretty much... Filmed the whole thing. They filmed the whole thing. It just it was so horrible. There was saying that it was such. I a wouldn't be surprised yeah. if it shows up later on, just like a Snyder cut they, later on. They cannot do that. So the the agreement was with the U.S. government was that if they are going to put it as a law, so they could recover their money, they could never ever show that it's gone forever. If uh, not, not necessarily. Uh, all right. Uh, I, I want all of you convention goers that are like myself that love your bootlegs. Go to your convention because I guarantee you in another year or two, you will see a bootleg that of that particular movie on DVD. I doubt it. You know why? Because the day that got announced, the filmmakers, everybody that was involved with that movie, all the servers that had the movies, those those files were gone. As Damn. I, yes. Those files were gone. The director, the right, everybody, producers, effects people, they were like, whoa, what happened to everything? And it's like, nope, Warner Brothers took all that and all of a sudden decided they can't because they, they didn't want to risk anyone right. making copies of it because everybody knew, OK, we're going to cancel this, but we're not going to tell anybody. So they took all the copies and then they, <laughs> they announced, tell everybody. <laughs> right. And then they announced <laughs> that, hey, this is canceled. And the re- again, the reason they did that is because if at any point any of those things actually get out. Warner Brothers owes the United States government those taxes, you know, that they, you know, they receive back. So they did have a private showing with the people who made it. So everybody that was involved in the crew and stuff like that, they had a one time private showing and said, hey, this is what we did. You see it, but that's it done. And then after that, they took everything off the servers. They 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 put that in a sealed vault now. Will it ever get out? Don't know. And if they do, who knows what the repercussions are. Hey. But that was the word yeah. is that they took everything off the server. I mean, the directors were like, what happened to uh every to the movie? And it's like, nope, <laughs> you don't have access to it anymore. Yeah. Well, hmm. you know, we got a Roger Corman Fantastic Four that's still out there in bootleg. So <laughs> obviously <laughs> it's a, it's still a possibility, but that had to do with they had to do uh, it right. Keeping the rights. Correct. And they kept the rights because they had to create a crappy film in order to maintain those rights. Because <laughs> they were sold way back when. Exactly. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be surprised, not in the near future, but in some sort of future, that will show up. Very much like the uh, Eric Stoltz Back to the Future, 75% of that movie being done uh, with Eric Stoltz right. instead of Michael J. Fox. And eventually we'll see that out of the vaults. They uh they they've shown uh pieces of the uh of you know a lot of that I mean they just did... a few snippets of real but we don't have the whole thing right I well would they never love to they never that. they never filmed a lot they I think they filmed like uh I don't think it was seventy five percent it was something like 
like the very beginning and they just said yeah this guy's just not working out and that's when they got no, they they said they filmed did at they? least a good 75 okay. percent. so all right and i i always go by that because there are a lot of back to the futures uh enthusiasts like ben beck who we all know and ben from Wilhelm loves back to the future and he'll probably agree with me right he'll probably tell me i'm wrong too and say no, it's only sixty five percent. Mark, you're an idiot, and it's true. Sixty five, probably three five percent. There you go. Yeah, but regardless, there, I wouldn't be surprised if some of it comes out at a later point, and uh, we will get some sort of snippet of it. But a majority of the movie was done, and uh, they could easily go direct to video, just like they did with Snyder Cut. And yes, the government will take ownership of it, like you were saying. Rob, there's a lot for us to look into when it comes to the DCU. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to it just as much as you are. Steve, I'm sure you're interested in seeing some of that stuff, too. Yeah, some of that stuff intrigues me. I'm, uh, I've am i never been a big DC fan, but uh, yeah. But uh, to move right along, just because uh, that, that was something I wanted to bring up. Rob had all the inside scoop because he'd been following all the news. And he's been, like, itching to get that out. And I've been loving to itch to hear yeah. that oh and we're and I, we'll get into it like on the podcast you know there's uh one of our guys um that's one of the new guys are going to be there he definitely has fantasy picks yeah he's definitely going to have a lot to say because he's a filmmaker and and things like that but yeah no it's just it's intriguing how you know this whole thing industry with, well this whole thing with especially with warner brothers and hbo and you know and and discovery how you know the mess that this the astute you know these things are yeah. and how they're trying to fix it and all this stuff and people are even saying well you know will if James Gunn uh, fails you know will Warner Brothers continue with this entire plan or will they fire him right away and get somebody else somebody was saying you know other people are saying well well will Disney buy off Warner Brothers which of course at that point, the government will get involved and say, listen, <laughs> you're no. franchising at yeah, this point. At this point, you're just kind of, <laughs> you know, you're kind of like uh, taking over the entire media, you know, business. And as a matter of fact, there's also been like, you know, they people think that the Fox deal should have never happened. But, yes. you know, there's a lot of, you know, of that. But that being said, yeah, no, it's been very interesting seeing how, like, this whole thing with Warner Brothers, you know, it, and everything that's happening with it is you, you're constantly hearing yeah. all this drama behind it. And hopefully, you know, again, let's see if James Gunn does what, you know, James Gunn knows how to do. And if he does and if he pulls this off, let me tell you, this guy writes his this guy has a golden ticket for the rest of his life. Well, it'll be the Kevin Feige and Kevin Feige's already give him his blessing too because he feels that right that james could actually do it and you know if we get james gunn be the next kevin feige for dc it'll look great we won't know that until that time when it, we get that first particular movie right. or show and obviously the first show that we've already gotten is obviously peacemaker right for one of brothers as it is because it's on hbo max and which is what we just covered everybody so get yeah. back yeah. to what we were talking about but um, uh, looking forward to season two. What 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 hopes do you? What are you guys looking forward to seeing when it comes to Peacemaker two? Steve, do you have any hopes and dreams? I mean, I already talked a little bit about just furthering furthering these characters along. You know, we're where we leave them at. We're gonna have to have some time pass. I don't. I it's a time jump, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, I trust, I trust whatever he's going to do. I think he's, uh, he's got a good, uh, if it is interesting, if, if Waller is going off into a different television show, how is there going to be a catalyst to bring these characters back together? That's what I'm going to be interested to see is we have Chris obviously is not in prison, mm -hmm. you know, where he technically should be in prison, right? Mm -hmm. Still, um, <laughs> and we have Harcourt doing physical therapy. We have Economist back at Bell Reeve. All we saw was uh, we saw Leota go back to her wife, and mm -hmm. and so I just I'm interested to see how we're going to get all these characters back together again. Uh, if it's going to be some Black Ops mission, is it going to be some furthering of the Butterfly story? Since 
I, I hope not. I hope they don't do a furtherance of the butterfly story. Same here. I, yeah, I, I, I would like done. it for be a new, a new venture for them. He's gone past his father's issues at this point. He has his collective friends. We know Harcourt is on the mend. Uh, Economist still loves his friends and has his desk job. Right. Something's going to come about to bring them together, and I think it might be Leota. Maybe. And because right. of L- Waller, her association, because Waller's her mom. And I wouldn't be surprised if Waller has an issue with something and says, damn it, I need Peacemaker. And right. then talks to Leota, and Leota says, well, I know where he... But he comes with a friend. His <laughs> name is Vigilante. <laughs> And, uh, Mom, I'll be there to rope him in, too. But I need my other friend, like, Economist. Oh, and could Harcourt come here and oversee? And then that would be my hopes and dreams, is that they get roped into some sort of specific mission that Waller is in charge of. But there's none of that, I'm going to put a bomb on your neck to blow up your head. And he is outsourced to bring somebody in. Maybe it's Harley Quinn. Maybe it's another character that is part of the DCU that we haven't seen yet. Right. Uh, or or somebody that they plan on doing. You never know. Booster Gold, Be- uh, Blue Beetle, who knows? But, uh, yeah, those, those are my thoughts on that when it comes to that. Uh, Rob, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, my thought on it, well... When I saw the ending, which is that Leota outs her mom, Waller, and tells everyone in a press conference that who the Suicide Squad is and what she's been doing and all the illegal stuff, I will. I'm very interested to see what the outcome of that is because that's going to get probably you know the government the involved. government involved, <laughs> knowing that hey, I can't believe this black ops, you know, you know, si- yeah. you know, uh unit has been going on and all these things and how is that going to affect all the characters also you know and and things like that but yeah i hope they come together in their own way and i'm sure they're going to come together in their own you know crazy way and i'm sure it's going to be very funny on whichever way they do it because there's always a you know this show is all about the humor and and the outrageousness of things (laughs) so i'm that's what i look forward to i just look forward to okay what crazy crap can these guys get themselves into and just the writing i'm looking forward to the writing on how cool uh if they did if they did a great job here hopefully they do a great job there but i'm pretty sure they'll do a yeah. second scene yeah, absolutely season just as well and justified as the first one is uh especially with the way the collaboration of all the actors and the writing crew correct uh, as well as james gunn's in- involvement um so uh, pretty much we uh, covered the idea of Peacemaker, where it's going, what we thought, what we loved, all the quotes. Uh, right now, what we'll do is we'll move right along and show some podcast love out there. So uh, to continue on with the DC love that's out there, uh, I'm going to promote something that I just started listening to and I suggest all of you start listening to as well. Uh and this will lead into a podcast get plug, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. But uh, the DC one literally is Harley Quinn and the Joker Sound Mind podcast. That's on Spotify. This is a uh, pretty much story based podcast with Christina Ricci playing the voice of Harley Quinn. Oh, and, and it's really really good. Uh, it's very much the uh, a new idea and iteration of how Harley meets Joker and how she becomes she's Harley Quinzel when she starts in the uh, in Arkham Asylum meets the Joker himself and then becomes the typical Harley Quinn as we know. Uh, it's about four or five episodes in right now and I highly recommend it. You can find that it's free on Spotify if you're a Spotify uh, subscriber obviously free to you as well but for those of us that uh, have the free pass, you get, you know, ads in there as well. Right. But I highly recommend it. So Christina Ricci as Harley Quinn on Spotify's uh, Harley Quinn and the Joker Sound Mind. Uh, hmm. And what, like I stated, this kind of moves right along into 
uh, Podcastica and their coverage of what Christina Ricci is in and involved in. And just to show some love, uh, you got Wendy, you got Penny, you got Daphne, and they're covering Yellow Jackets WTF. And they just put out something recently because, as we all know, Yellow Jackets are coming. Buzz, buzz, buzz. It's coming out in uh, March, as far as I know. And uh, we all look forward to it, but they have covered the trailer, the most recent trailer that has come out for Yellow Jackets. So you could hear that on podcast for Yellow Jackets WTF. Uh, you could hear a lot of feedback from myself or from Mr. Steve Brown himself right here. And when they cover on podcast for the cast of us, which is a podcast based upon the last of us. And I think it's uh, a really good show that is also on HBO Max, and I highly recommend that. So if those of you who are into the video game, The Last of Us, watch the show on HBO Max of The Last of Us and uh, listen to the cast of us on uh, Podcastica. You know, they, they have their own HBO Max podcast. Everybody has a podcast now. AMC Plus has their own, um, but... Uh, as well to cover their own shows, but uh, the podcast crew is doing theirs as well. Uh, we got Mr. Blog himself, Eric Fenton, uh, Jason himself, Mr. Kabasi, and Ben Beck and Rima Joe, and they're all in there and covering The Last of Us. Occasionally you'll hear Lucy, but you could also hear myself on occasion if I do submit some vocal feedback. But definitely Mr. Steve Brown himself, who will do his continuous versions of live Steving, as we all know. Hmm. So you get to hear the Steve. Um, and on top of that, you could hear Run For Your Lives that is now on Podcastica. Not no longer on the PyroCore Entertainment Network, but I'm glad they, they got a great home. Daphne and Paik doing things they love to do and covering everything that makes you run for your lives. So... I'm loving the fact that they, uh, they're they doing more, and they're putting out stuff <laughs> weekly, uh, better than us at this point, <laughs> but uh, here on Panels of Pixels, as well as Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. But uh, also, uh, there is a new show on podcast. Uh, Steve, what is it called? It's Showtime, folks, right? Yes, it's so, Showtime, folks. That's another yeah. podcast, like podcast where they just basically... They cover whatever movie that those guest hosts choose to cover for that week. It's um, different people every week from Podcastica, from the Podcasting Network, uh, covering different movies. And I'll uh, occasionally pop in there with a live Steve for them. <laughs> yeah, same here as well, because uh, I think the most recent one that I just listened to was Ben and Kristen, and they were covering everything always all at once. I'm uh, forgetting the name of the movie. Everything, everywhere. Yeah. Everything, <laughs> everywhere. Uh, everything, everywhere, all at once. That's it. There we yeah. go. <laughs> Michelle Yeoh movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic movie. If you haven't seen it, that is a movie that you must watch. Yeah. And check out the podcast, too. It's on podcast. Yeah. And uh, it's showtime, folks. Uh, and to talk more about podcast, uh, Rob. Fantasy Picks, let's talk about that. Yeah, so Fantasy Picks, uh, we're going into our second season. Uh, we will be uh, having our first episode probably. It's going to be, I believe, is on the 23rd. Um, and we're going to be discuss. our first episode is going to be discussing the um, the state of the industry, basically, of, you know, of the of the film industry and the entertainment industry and where are things going, how we see things happening. I mean, all the mess that's out there, especially with... Um, studios uh and the way media is being distributed nowadays so yeah we're going to be discussing that with a new crew that we're you know we're getting in uh mm -hmm. some of them are uh, filmmakers others are artists in the uh in the actual industry and things like that so it's going to be very exciting but we're going to be a little more consistent hopefully and we're going to try to be uh you know uh, throw out more podcasts out there hopefully this year we'll we'll double or triple our episodes compared to last year. Last year, I felt like it was more of a uh, kind of a what I would say an experiment on, uh, <laughs> you know, whether uh, it's something that, you know, because as you know, we always do this as a hobby and it's not something where 
we're being, you know, it's not a uh, a career. We're not getting paid for we're it. We're not getting paid for it. So, <laughs> but, so yeah, my my whole thing was, hey, do I continue with this? Uh, but, you know, some people like it and I, I like it, of course, you know, it takes my yeah. mind off of things, but it's a great way to discuss the actual industry and we have fun with, you know, friends and things like that. But yeah, so the first episode is going to be, uh, again, on the 23rd. Mm-hmm. Um Oh, actually, not on the 23rd. I'm sorry. We're recording on the 23rd. And then after that, a few days later, we'll actually uh, release. Re- so release. by the end of February, you'll have a new episode of Fantasy is Fantasy Picks Movie Edition on the PyroCore Entertainment Network. So you, all you have to do is go to PyroCoreEntertainment.com. Correct. Find the links there. Or you could just go to uh, FantasyPicksMovieEdition.com, right? Uh, that, that website is not up yet, but yeah, soon it will be too. <laughs> soon it will be. Uh, but you also have uh, social media as well too. Like that Facebook. is correct. Com, as well as Instagram and Instagram. Twitter possibly. That's right. So, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's pretty much it for in my part. <laughs> uh, also you could hear me on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. You could hear that on a Pirate Car Entertainment Network as well. Uh, coming up soon, obviously. You'll be hearing uh, Jerry and I cover Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1972. Cool. Or or 71. Well, I forget the year. <laughs> but it's out there. Uh, it was with Donald Sutherland. You got to sit there and listen to it. I still have to finish and finalize the editing on it. That's a little bit of an issue. And then after that, you'll be hearing uh, my, our friend Danny Espinota. And he'll be uh, leading the way. For us, when we cover season one of Interview with a Vampire on AMC Plus with Lara and myself uh, guesting on. So we had a great time having uh, a talk about uh, Interview with a Vampire season one, because I believe next season when it comes in for season two, Danny will be hosting and uh, I won't be in charge. It'll be Danny. And uh, I'm hoping... By then, he'll have a good feel of how to do things. I had to interject a little bit here and there, as I usually do, but I'm loving to get my friends getting in them into podcasting, and I think this is a good uh, way to get Danny into it. Plus, it was our first time actually doing a TV show on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast, so uh, it was a fun way to segue into that. So it was new stepping stones for Adrenaline Cinema. Because not only is it in the theater, it's also in the theater in your home. So that was the idea and uh, the thought. So eventually, hopefully in time, we could get you more shows like that. And you have people like Rob or Steve, myself, or anybody else that I have friends are that are interested in doing TV shows just the same. That get our adrenaline going. Things that we love to do. Uh... We liked interview with the uh, vampire, Danny and myself. And then Lara said, I want in. So she came on. We talked a little bit about uh, uh, Mayfair witches. And I didn't say it like Pake did because I kind of made a few mistakes and called it Wayfair Mitches. Like Pake had stated a few times. Uh, But Rima didn't really want to continue that on Strange Indeed, which I understand because she didn't feel like she could cover something that she wasn't wholeheartedly into and i have major respect for that uh i still watch it i don't know if it's hate watching but i kind of dropped off after the third or fourth episode (laughs) and i was just like where's this show going but interview really caught my eye but i still watch uh mayfair witches just to see how it's going and what they're doing with the property uh, because AMC has purchased all of uh, Anne Rice's material, a lot of it actually, as we talked about on interview. So check that out. Interview with the Vampire Season 1, as well as Invasion of the Body Snatchers on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast, which you could hear both fi- Fantasy <laughs> fantasy Picks Movie Edition and Adrenaline Cinema Podcast on com. So check that out for links. Uh, Steve? You're live steving still. You uh, have yeah, been live still, steving for a while still I, in, in your absence, but uh, I, it's great I to hear been, your voice. Yeah, two minutes two minutes of my time is a lot easier than an hour and a half. An hour and a half uh, tends to, <laughs> to, to act up my uh, issues. But uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm still sending in uh, for the Revisited podcast with Ben and Kristen. They're back 
covering Lost there in season five. So you can hear my voice uh, on uh, all the episodes of that. I try to get that into them uh, there. And I will be uh, guesting on a podcastic a show, uh, th- hopefully this week, uh, episode six of Poker Face. The name of that awesome. podcast is Murder Magnets, and it's on the Podcastica Network, and I should be on hopefully this week. Awesome. Cool. So check that out. Podcastica. Steve's going to be guesting on Poker Face, how they cover that. And it's called, what was it? It's Murder Magnets is the name of the, the podcast. Murder Magnets on Podcastica. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, listeners, I'm going to bring it up, and I brought it up. At one point when Rob was on, on one of the last few podcasts we did, I said, jokes are coming. I asked you guys to send in a joke. You guys haven't sent one in. I'm giving you one. All right. It's a Marvel joke. All right, guys. Listen to this. What do Wanda and Daredevil have in common? They're both in red. They both lack vision. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> very good. Uh, okay. So, very, bad joke of the week very, already. Very dad joke. <laughs> it is a very dad joke, but all right, listeners, I already said it. Send one in. Send in a joke that we could tell the you know everybody else if you have one. Marvel, DC, anything comic book related. Hell, it could be Little Orphan Annie. It's still a comic. Give it in. Uh, if it's dirty, even better. No, well, probably because <laughs> I don't think any of the little kids are out there. Unless you know, we have to tell them. All right, earmuffs. <laughs> Put them on the kids at that point. But yeah, I said it. Jokes are coming. If you don't provide one, I'm going to. Or one of us is going to. <laughs> All right. So uh, that kind of ends it for this particular podcast. Uh, and uh, I think we covered Peacemaker Season 1 and had a really good time at doing it. So uh, all I have to say is uh, same podcast, different panel, different pixel. I'm Mark. I'm Rob. I'm Steve. <laughs> and I'm Rob. I'm sorry. I, there was no, uh, you know. It's Rob and Steve. <laughs> Rob and Steve here. So. <laughs> <laughs> and this was Panels to Pixels, and we'll see you guys on the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Good night. Bye. Uh, I totally screwed that one up. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's fun. It's fun. Kahargate, Mario, Super Mario, fucking Luigi, Yoshi, the princess, Bert, Ernie, Grover, Snuffleupagus, Burger King, Grimace, Ronald McDonald, two old guys from the balcony and the Muppets, Jim Morrison, any one of the fucking Beatles, Pete Best, George Carlin, Dead, Danny Glover, Mel Gibson, Ice-T, Ice Cube, Vanilla Ice, Elvis fucking Presley, Priscilla Presley, Seth Meyers, what about Seth Meyers, or for that matter, Jay Leno, Conan's not really doing much right now. All right, most of those, you're right, could probably go to prison, but I would never put Ariana Grande in there. She looks too innocent. Possibly true. Possibly.